Welcome everybody. This is Stephen Ramsden, director of the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project, coming to you live from Atlanta, GA. I'm also a Mead Coronado brand ambassador. Today we got a cool treat for you. If you want to skip right to it, it's going to happen um, 27, let's see, 15, yeah, 27 minutes from now. We should see the International Space Station transit the face of the sun. But for now, we're going to talk and have uh, maybe a couple of guests chime in or whatever. But we're going to enjoy some views of our nearest star and talk a little bit about it. The equipment we're using today is a AP-1200 mount, a uh, <clears throat> Astro Hutech solar guider, and a double stacked 90 millimeter Coronado H-Alpha solar telescope. I have a point gray 6 megapixel pixel grasshopper plugged in and I'm using a 27 inch iMac running Astro IIDC software. Right now we're looking at the sun with the gamma turned up so we can check out the prominences. The nice one there, here, one over here, uh, a couple of filaments here and there, some active areas. And I'm going to turn the gamma down a little bit so you can see the surface detail better. There we go. These are filaments, these black lines, and they're a little bit cooler than the uh, lower region of the chromosphere. These filaments are arching loops of hydrogen plasma that are being held aloft by magnetic field lines. And they're a little bit higher up into the chromosphere than the background area, which is a medium gray. All this texture is called modeling. And the whiter areas, the bright areas, these are um, active regions, hot plasma. So anything in any kind of astronomy, uh, the brighter the color, the hotter the object you're looking at, in this case, the plasma. The darker the color, the dimmer the object. So we're looking at a monochrome image of the chromosphere of our nearest star, the sun, El Sol. And I'll turn it back up a little bit so you can get the prominences. I'm going to work on the focus just a tad. Everybody stand by. These are fun for me to do because I'm actually sitting in my driveway in uh, Midtown Atlanta. A couple of clouds going by, no big deal. And that focus is a little bit better. <laughs> I'm in my driveway and uh, got all this gear set up out here. Of course, people come by and think I'm crazy. And they always ask, what are you looking at? What are you doing? Is that a telescope? I go, yeah, man, come on over here and take a look. The UPS guy just came by delivering some stuff. And he wanted to look at it. So he came over and got a little solar outreach. And that's what we do at the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project. We try to get anybody we can get to come look through our telescopes and enjoy the sun and think about something outside of their uh, usual field of experience every day realize their place in the solar system and the galaxy and the universe and maybe um, you know go and do their own outreach for people share what they love with people uh, we believe it's the only hope for the future of our species we've got to get to Mars we've got to get to the moon we've got to get interstellar travel going and it ain't gonna happen by complaining on Facebook so we try to get people uh, hands-on experience looking at the Sun there's a couple of clouds going by. I'll switch over to the uh, camera. And there it is. Um, hey, look at that. My uh, banner is backwards. There we go. Try that. Ah, there we go. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, we're having a good time. And the sky is mostly clear, maybe 15, 20% uh, clouds. And I believe we're going to have a beautiful solar transit. What's going to happen at 4.13 p.m. my time in approximately 23 minutes, the uh, International Space Station is going to orbit the Earth right above us and cross right in between my telescope and the sun. We're not exactly on center line, so it's going to be offset just a little bit. Um, but it's still going to be awesome. You're going to love it. And I'm going to turn off that uh, 
banner down there because everybody knows who I am. And everybody knows I'm a Mead brand ambassador. And Coronado Solar Scope sponsors our program. We love Mead. And uh, Celestron also sponsors our program. But uh, everybody works together for this to share science because every telescope company benefits when you get more people interested in astronomy. So we don't go in for that competition stuff here. We um, we just do outreach. And whoever wants to uh, sponsor us, we're, we're happy for it. So let me turn off my overlay. Boom. There you go. Now you just have my handsome face. Yes, I am quite handsome. It won't be long. The sun's back out, so I want to go ahead and share the image of the sun with you again. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, so I'm trying my best to keep everything going right. But uh, in 21 minutes from now, the space station will cross the face of the sun, and you will see it live on this broadcast. I can't wait. <laughs> This will be a one second transit, which is a little bit longer than usual because the sun is uh, about 30 degrees above the uh, horizon right now. So it's not overhead. There we go. All right, there's our sun again. I'm going to put it in the center real quick. Like I said, this will be a. Uh, a transit a little bit longer than normal because it normally it takes about 0.2 seconds for the uh, sun to cross the face I'm sorry the International Space Station to cross the face of the sun because it's orbiting of course very rapidly so if the sun were directly overhead we would get a 57 arc second silhouette of the International Space Station and it would take 0.2 seconds to cross the face of the sun since the sun is um, 60 degrees away from overhead, what we're going to get is a smaller silhouette, about 35 arc seconds. And it's going to take 0.9 seconds to transit the face of the sun. So it'll be about two thirds as big as it could be, but we'll have five times as much opportunity to get single frames of the sun. So it's kind of a trade off. Here come some more clouds. I love the clouds. so. I'm fine with that. I just hope the clouds aren't there when the when the space station crosses. And we won't know that until the time comes. Like I say, it's about 20% cloud cover, so it's unlikely. But you never know. So we're just going to have fun until then. And again, I'm using a double stacked 90 millimeter Coronado Solar Scope, Solar Max 2. I'm sorry, I'm using an original Solar Max scope. You know, they just came out with the Solar Max 3 scope, which uh, on my recommendation and a lot of hard work from their engineers now has a really cool Crayford focuser on it instead of the helical focuser. And it's got a redesigned uh, optical tube and they went back to the original metal brass tube, which is super cool, man. I like that tube a lot. When you pull out your uh, Coronado 90 millimeter scope at a star party or an outreach event, uh, nobody questions it. You clearly mean business, and everybody's like, okay, there it is. <laughs> so it's a great scope to have. I'm very fortunate to uh, to have one of the originals here. The optical quality has remained consistently good through all their uh, generations of the Solar Max, and right now they're selling the Solar Max 3 scopes, which are also fantastically great for visual astronomy of the sun. Everybody stand by. If you don't want to listen to me jabber, you can just turn the volume down. And we will see it. Currently, it's 3.54 p.m. here in Atlanta. And the ISS transit will occur at 4.13 p.m. and 20 seconds. So we're going to start the cameras rolling at about 4.12 and 30 seconds because I have missed these before. <laughs> and there's nothing worse than getting everything set up, getting out there, getting ready to go. And you find out your watch is about three minutes off and you miss the whole thing. That's not going to happen this time because I have learned my lesson filming several of these ISS transits. Hey, Mark. Mark Merlin just joined us, uh, founder of Atlanta Science Tavern. He's going to watch in with us. Let's see. I'll switch over to the uh, computer cam.
All right, here we go. Come on over and wave to our crowd, Mark. Hello, everybody. Let's see. There it is there. So you got to move this way. Yeah, there's. Oh, knocked over my drink. Mark Merlin has made an entrance. Mark runs the Atlanta Science Tavern, uh, the best science group in Atlanta. They meet uh, two or three times a month and discuss really cool science topics. He's also my neighbor. Yep. So we're very fortunate to have Mark joining us. Fantastic. And the transit will occur in 17 minutes. And let me run and get you a chair real quick. This is live. And uh, we'll put on and you can talk about the Atlanta Science Tavern. Get you a chair. Hello, everyone, whoever's out there. As Stephen mentioned, I, uh, I'm the organizer of the Atlanta Science Tavern. And uh, we've been happy to have Stephen up here and talk to our group at least on one occasion. And I'm a big supporter of his uh, annual fundraiser, which is coming to an end, I think, in a couple of days. I'm sure he's already mentioned it. Anyway, I, uh, I happened to see his announcement a few days ago about the transit of the ISS and decided I would bike down here and say uh, hello. So hello, everybody, whoever's out there. And here comes Stephen back with a chair for me. Fantastic. Okay, here we go. Mark came up on his uh, bicycle. He's a avid cyclist here in Atlanta and is always publishing um, awesome photos that he takes on the belt line in places. So let's get the sun back in the center and we'll go back over here to the solar view. We've got 15 minutes before the transit. Mark, you're going to be greatly underwhelmed by it probably because. It'll be my uh, first, first time. Good. Fantastic. Glad to share it with you. Mark's also a big supporter of the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project, a yearly donor. You can put that chair in the dirt if you want to get a little closer. And there's some sunglasses for you. Go ahead and put your glasses on and let's show. So you got to slide this way to be in the frame. There he is. <laughs> See, that's what they're seeing right there. Okay. <laughs> cool. And of course, they don't work under the blanket, but uh, we have them if we need them. You'll have to manage that blanket yourself. All right, so I'm going to go back and uh, share the live view Mark and I are getting from the cameras. Don't worry about it. All right. Where will the entrance be? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it will be going this way. It's hard to say because I have the sun aligned north-south. That's a good question. I have the sun aligned north-south, but... If it were noon, that would be the alignment in the sky. But as the sky rotates, it the sun also rotates. So north is really um, that way. Now, when the sun sets, its western limb is facing up from our point of view because the field rotates as it goes through the sky. So What's the, our angular field of view just for the sun? Well, the sun is 0.5 seconds across, the same size as the moon. Half, um, half a degree, I'm sorry. And the ISS will be how large? 35 arc seconds. It will be small. It will be about the size of this cursor. And it should, let's see, that's north-south. So it's that way it should go. I'm forecasting something like that. But we'll see. Because I'm not on the center line, so it's going to be offset maybe over, over this way. That's the thing about this. It's kind of complicated, and I haven't worked out all the math. Oh, yeah, I saw the math that you... Uh posted we are off so we are off center aren't we yeah the shadow for this transit or uh like during the eclipse the um the width of the shadow is 14 kilometers and we are about three kilometers off center line 
So we should be about one quarter of the way out. So right about here should be the crossing point center line, hopefully. But, uh, you know, it may come in and, and, and do that. <laughs> you see, I forgot, have you seen the transits? Yeah, I've filmed several ISS transits, gotten several pictures published. Um, in fact, one of my first uh, claim to fame was an ISS transit photograph I took in 2010 that turned out really good. Wow. And a guy up in New York City saw it online, Alan Trano. And just out of the blue, he contacted me on social media and said, hey, man, come up and uh, speak at our astronomy convention. And that's kind of how I got uh, got into the astronomy convention circuit where I give lectures at conventions and things. So a, a, even though we look at the sun every day and to us, everything on air is fascinating. Um, the public likes to see things move and stuff blow up and stuff like that. So um, the ISS transit was a very popular thing for the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project. Were you ever able to see a shuttle transit? No, no. Um, the shuttle would be so large it would block out the entire sun because it's at a, it would it would be well unless it was in orbit. Then, in orbit. Um, there have been some pictures of the shuttle connected to the space station uh, taken. I have not taken one of those. Um, by the time I got into this, the shuttle program had pretty much shut down. So you were going to go to a SpaceX upcoming SpaceX. Right, we got a big weekend planned. Um, about three hours from now, me and Robert Reeves will be doing a live broadcast of the moon at first quarter from this very spot. He'll be joining me from San Antonio, and he'll be discussing uh, the moon and some of its features while I broadcast it live. And then tomorrow is International Moon Day, but our party got canceled tomorrow because uh, it's going to rain. So we're doing it today. And then uh, Sunday morning or maybe tonight, I'll be driving down to Cape Canaveral to watch a Falcon 9 launch and re-entry of the first stage landing on the barge Large. right what's the payload do you know it's a korean communication satellite that's going up and it's going to launch monday at 3 40 so i'll be driving down there for that too we just adjusted the uh, image to show maximum surface detail yeah, that's sure. um and mark these are filaments these are um loops of plasma coming above the surface and going wow. back down and the reason they're darker is because they're a little bit cooler than the uh, chromosphere beneath them. They cool as they extend upwards and they're tracing out magnetic field lines that are coming out of the sun's photosphere and going back into it. What are you using? This is a Coronado 90 millimeter double stack solar telescope showing you the hydrogen alpha hydrogen. wavelength, 656.28 nanometers. We are seeing the uh, middle chromosphere layers and these white areas are active regions and they're uh, hotter than the background. Just put that anywhere you want to put it. There you go. The white areas are hotter and the dark areas are cooler. So to me, every day is awesome on the sun. This is a sunspot. This is a sunspot. And they're small. They're not quite as clear in hydrogen alpha as they would be in a white light view of the sun. But I chose this particular wavelength because it looks really cool and it's, it's uh, usually what everybody wants to see. So we're going to image in, in this wavelength today. And we've got uh, nine minutes before the space station transits. I'm always impressed uh, with how steady the tracking is. I mean, I've never <laughs> seen any jitter at all. That's because we have a $16,000 mount holding a telescope. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. awfully small steps. Very, very, very precise. And I also have a device on it called a solar tracker which um, if you look up here, it's that white box on top of the scope. Uh -huh. That is a Astro Hutech solar guider, and it actually has a photoreceptive cell on it that senses the position of the sun. It goes through a little dot and shines onto a pad, and it senses any movement in that dot, and it sends the opposite movement to the mount. And does that work in conjunction with the tracker? Or yes, that, it, or it, it, it augments the tracking. Augment the tracking. This right. mount would probably track it pretty much the same without the guider, but I use the guider anyway because I never have to adjust it or recenter anything with the guider. Is a reverse true? Could you track this with the guider? Yes. Yeah. I, but the mount has to be turned on. And telescope mounts, let's see. All right. My buddy Jeff Eirick says he's watching the live broadcast. All right, Jeff. I hope Madison gets a chance to see this. Jeff and Madison were over here two days ago when uh, Jeff Notkin, meteorite man, was visiting. Oh, yeah. I saw you got a great picture of one of the meteorites. Yep. And uh, we're going to be in his new book, Empirical World, Faces and Friends of Science. Is that the picture of you in front of the King sculpture? Yeah. I, who are you with the 
uh, Madison Eirich, who is the daughter of the guy I was just mentioning. She's a local science prodigy. She can recite 61 digits of pi <laughs> and even knows what pi means. Not just not only does she memorize pi, but she also knows what it means. Probably. We took about 60 photos. We're going to choose. Um, he let me choose the location, and I thought the MLK Memorial would be a great place to have it. So um, hopefully that picture will make the book, but we'll find out. I'm going to go ahead and make a run of the uh, video here, and you can see on the screen um, it's taking 600 frames of this in a movie. And um, later on, I can stack all those frames together and get a super high resolution image of the sun. I'm probably going to leave it at this setting for the transit so we can get a nice black silhouette. Yeah, you take in all astronomy, you take um, several hundred, maybe several thousand, depending on how much noise you have frames. And you put them into some program that's called a stacking software. I use Astro IIDC for that. And it stacks all the frames on top of each other and greatly uh, decreases or increases your signal to noise ratio. So it's uh, the same thing as taking a long exposure photo with a DSLR, except you're creating a long exposure photo by several hundred right. fraction of a second exposures. Yes. But I mean, so what about this? Do you see this type of jitter? Is that actually dynamic or is that jitter, is that jitter or is that actually surface activity that we see that little variation around? The right. Edge? This is caused by the Earth's atmosphere. Right. You're looking through 300,000 feet of water vapor right now. Oh, and I see. I see it in the center, too. It's not just. Yeah, it's everywhere on the disk. Um, just like you're in a pool trying to read a book. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing jittery, uh, jitteriness of the water vapor in the atmosphere. So the, mo the more humid the day is, the worse the seeing is. Today's seeing is about 7, maybe 8 out of 10, which is really good. Sometimes I've seen it, Mark, where you couldn't even see any features sharply. The whole thing was just wobbling, and it really did look like reading a book so un how underwater. how does the software deal with that, those variations? Does it tend to blur, or does it pick out best? representative pixels or another great question it averages the sharpness in all of your files and then you tell it what percentage of the files do you want to stack if i have a thousand frames i might tell it to stack the best five percent of those frames and it will average the sharpness and it will pick the five percent of frames that are the sharpest and stack them together and discard the others so there's some judgment yeah the software picks out what it thinks are the best frames and we have five minutes now before our transit. I'm glad Mark stopped by. He's an excellent uh, filler Western. person. <laughs> he gives me, gives me a great filler. I love this stuff. With the sun, um, it's a dynamic body, though, also. Not just the atmosphere is moving, but the sun itself is also moving uh, very rapidly. So when you're taking um, a video capture of the sun, you want to keep it under 90 seconds because the surface small details on the surface can change so much in a three minute period that your resulting image would be blurred because of the dynamic activity on the sun. Well, it's got another great question. It's got differential rotation. Every latitude rotates at a different speed and that's what causes active regions and magnetic storms. The uh, poles rotate every 24 days and the equator rotates every 27 days of full rotation. So if you have a sunspot here, or when a sunspot gets on the limb here, you're going to see it for about 12 days before it gets over here and goes around the back of the sun. So the actual rotation isn't something you have to worry about in this frame. Capture. Not when you're when you're capturing frames. No, it doesn't rotate fast enough to blur the frames. But the uh, actual things on the sun are moving very rapidly, and you do have to worry about that. Like with the moon, I could take a 50,000 frame video of the moon over an hour, and nothing on the moon would change. So that's not a factor with the moon, but with the sun, uh, everything on the surface changes all the time. So it's a very dynamic body. It's a giant ball of hot plasma. That's correct. We always see basically the same face of the moon. There is a little bit of libation uh, of the moon, but it doesn't affect any kind of... I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. So I'm not a lunar specialist, but tonight on our live broadcast, we are going to have Robert Reeves, who is a lunar specialist. What time's your broadcast tonight? Uh, about 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. Of course, you're, be doing from here? Yes. Oh, 
and I only have a brief window where I can see the moon, as you can tell from my driveway between the uh, tall houses. So I'll turn it back up again so we can look at these prominences. And these prominences are the same as these filaments, so just you're looking at them from the side here and from the top here. And if you notice, Mark, um, right along that edge of the limb, there's a lighter gray ring around the entire sun. Those are called spicules. And you're looking sideways into the depth of the chromosphere. So that's a very cool feature. You can only see on a really precisely tuned H alpha telescope. So what I'm going to do now is get ready to record the transit. And I know from previous experience that you can't take any chances. So I'm going to just continuously record this frame starting at about 60 seconds. And we'll just wait for it to occur. This is for the, for the video or for the frame stacking or both? Both. Um, I'll record a video. And I'll pull out individual frames that show the transit and I'll do something with them. And then I'll also uh, make a nice video and do something with that. I'm not sure yet. I don't do a whole lot of processing. I'm not a APOD type guy, but um, we'll do something with it, make it pretty. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start recording. So now we just wait and keep your eyes on the disk, everybody, and wait for it to pass right now. It is 4.12 p.m. When it hits 4.13, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cross. So we are recording. Everything's a go. Now we wait. Are you excited, Mark? I am. <laughs> hoping that uh, my eyes are getting up and I'll spot it quickly. Well. There's, what, eight or nine people in it right now. This is real people in a real spaceship. Any second now. Hopefully. Hmm. Did we miss it or what? time synced up to you there, there it is just or, passed oh, that, wow, that fantastic just that. passed okay so what i'm going to do now is bring up the movie so we can watch it again <laughs> man i tell you what you know i thought that oh i was thinking holy crap I, I didn't do something right i'm not in the right place something happened but like i said when i started this video you just have to let it keep right, going right, right. because it's always oh, awesome that was <laughs> wasn't that cool and I could see a really good silhouette of it too. So I'm gonna run that movie again, and let's see what it looks like. It's gonna have to convert. Everybody, stand by for a minute, and I will run that movie again. Is this 4K or what's your quality? Oh, it's more than 4K. More than 4K. <laughs> Way more. So we'll be able to see some detail. 4K is for sissies. Um, you'll see a silhouette, and I'm not exactly sure what we're gonna see. Again, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Okay, I'm waiting for the video to convert. Everybody stand by. Oh, it's very exciting here. <laughs> that was cool, huh? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I didn't expect it to go by so quickly. And that was a slow pass. You should see the fast ones. Really, uh, I guess it makes <laughs> sense given the geometry. All right, so we're waiting for the video to uh, do a little processing. And what we just saw was the International Space Station cross from the upper right to the lower left, pretty much opposite of what I said it was going to do. And I think we got at least two frames out of that, maybe five or six. We'll find out. What will be your time resolution in, uh, in the video with the smallest time interval? Uh, one seventh of a second. This, this camera records seven frames per second, and I was setting it at three millisecond exposures. So ideally we have seven three millisecond exposures but probably we're going to end up with two or three based on what i know about the camera maybe one of those will be super high res and um, you probably won't be able to see tiny details on the station but you will be able to clearly make out that it's a tie fighter from the star wars movies um, going by 
So everybody hang tight. Man, that was awesome. And again, this was filmed with our double stack Coronado 90 millimeter solar telescope um, using a uh, point gray camera, six megapixel monochrome camera and Astro IIDC software. Is that, is that, is that a, is that a open source software? No, um, it's a uh, very expensive software, really? but the guy went out of business and I bought the rights to it. Okay. And uh, I use only Max in my program, <clears throat> which is unusual uh, in United States astronomy for some reason. Um, but Astro IIDC is the software to use. So any minute now we'll have this ready and I'll share the, the video and we'll go frame by frame. Yeah. Well, you know, the fan on this Mac is very at the top of the screen here and this blanket is laying over the top of the screen. So Mark and I can see the screen, but it's also blocking the fan. That's why I have some software on here that makes the fan run do 10 times make, faster. Do they make hoods for these displays? Maybe I could contribute one to this. <laughs> No, they don't. <laughs> I wish they did. You know, a lot of guys you know, use a refrigerator box. Um, I just use these blankets. Actually, this blanket was made for me by Marie Lott of the Atlanta Astronomy Club. And I have another couple that were made for me by uh, Dale Harrison. I just hope I got the right video. Okay. Let me share this screen with our viewers. Okay. Uh, there it is. Okay, so right now you're watching a recorded video. We're gonna scroll it backwards and see what we got here with the uh, ISS. This blanket is hard to manage, isn't it? <laughs> the wind blows it, and you gotta. There it is. Look at that! It only got one frame. Really, I thought I saw one further up. We did. It just didn't catch it. So we got one frame of the ISS. Tell you what, I'll play it again so you can watch it, everybody at home. Get ready. It's going to go from the top center to the lower right. We'll play it again. Here we go. There it went. Oh, I think we do have. Yeah, I think we have two or three, actually. Maybe it's advancing more than one frame at a time. So let's go back. Oh, it's advancing by the second. That's what it is. So I got three or four frames in that second. You're right, it's just like a tie fighter. Yeah, it does. And you, well, that's a really good transit. I mean, I, I know these things, and I'm going to be able to, to get that thing going. All right. Let me uh, see if we can zoom in, if I can figure out how to do that. Um, if you, let's see. I want to increase size. Okay. Let me see if I can touch this magic Mac button. And there, and boom, boom, won't let me get any bigger. Why not? All right, well, we can't get any bigger right now, but I guarantee you, you will see some results on Facebook, of course, shortly. Isn't that incredible, man? See that? You can see the solar panels and the body, and, and Mark, it's, it's not this way, it's twisted right, this way. Right. So the panel on the bottom is a little bit behind the fuselage, whatever you would call that. Yeah, yeah. And the panel on the top is pointed towards us. And I can even see with my brand new, new spangled, new fangled birding glasses I bought. Yeah. These are actually nothing. But I can see some holes in the solar panel. So let me tell you, we're going to get that thing processed. I'm going to call up uh, Damien Peach and have him do some magic on it. <laughs> you have a lot of things to work with here. I do. I do. I can zoom in to pretty much that size and still have a 4k image so it, it'll be good all right so i'm going to turn off the uh camera here and let's get ourselves in the center <clears throat> all right man you saw it here this is uh stephen ramson and my buddy mark merlin we just watched the international space station transit the sun's disc through some coronado solar max 90 millimeter telescope and man it was awesome it was it was amazing. <laughs> All right, so tune in in a couple hours. We're going to do some cool stuff with Robert Reeves and a live lunar broadcast. And then Monday, don't forget, I'm going to be down at Cape Canaveral uh, filming and hopefully live Facebooking the Falcon 9 launch of SpaceX. And sometime between 3.30 and 5, they don't know. So I'm going to be down there the whole time, and we'll have uh, some live broadcasts of that for you, too. So until then, this is Stephen Ramsden and Mark Merlin. Adios, amigos. Take care.